portals. More recently, we added our technical webinars and we have been doing queue management principles, convenient catering, my fingerprint, my DNA design, and there is so much more to come. Let me remind you that if you have missed any of our sessions, they're all available on the JBDC's YouTube channel at JBDC Jamaica. All you have to do is subscribe and watch at any time. And then also, but, but note that you have to subscribe in order to be notified when the videos are published. Now to this morning's session, as I said before, we will be focusing on building customer-centered businesses and our presenter is Ms. Janet C. Smythe, and she's the CEO of Choice Business Solutions. Before I introduce Ms. Smythe, let me remind you that there is a question and answer section. Once she is completed her presentation, you will be allowed to ask questions um, when the, at that time. What you can do, however, however, if you have a burning question during her presentation, just type it in the chat so that you don't forget and that I won't forget as well. Now to Ms. Smythe. She, as I said before, she's the CEO of Choice Business Solutions. Society dictates there are some rules that women, there are some roles that women were made for. Due to that they perform effortlessly simply because of their sex. A nurturer and cherisher would not have topped the list for entrepreneurs. But with Janet Smite, CEO of Choice Business Solutions, and the brain behind the people line, you'll have to think twice. This passionate and powerful go-getter has comfortably taken her place in a world of business and commerce once dominated by men. Prior to her entry into business, though, she was a teacher who is trained and who trained and practiced at the early childhood and secondary level. She also lectured at the University of the West Indies and devised a curriculum for project management at the Mona School of Business. She's also an accountant who has worked with KPMG, Ryan Neville, and JetBlue. There is so much more that, I, that could be said about Ms. Smythe, but I will allow her to share the rest. Ladies and gentlemen, please make Ms. Smythe welcome. Hey, hi, hi guys. Nice, nice to be here. Thanks, Asia, for that introduction. Um, well, I'll just go straight into the presentation um, and then I'm sure I can actually answer any questions as it relates to me right after that. So I'm going to try and share my screen. Okay, is everyone seeing my screen now? Yes, we're seeing your screen. You know, as I was um, getting prepared for the presentation this morning, I actually thought about why I would be asked to present something like this. Um, uh, customer service not really being something that I can say is, oh, is first on my, um, on my resume. However, it kind of took me back to base. I mean, I am a business owner. Our company is almost like 16 years old. And it's an area I think that if most of us do not deliberately think about we're likely to follow to the market. So it gave me a chance to really look at where I was and where my business was and what were the things we could actually do. So in doing the presentation this morning, I thought that first and foremost, I would actually kind of ground us, making sure that we were all on the same page, making sure that we moved and understood what, from, a, from all perspectives, who were the customers, which is section one. Section two of the presentation, we'll be looking at customer-centered business, centered business versus, well, if it's not customer-centered, um, what is it? Section three, building a customer-centered business. And that third, fourth, but not um, least, is the most important tools as far as an organization is concerned to be used in building a, building a customer-centered business. So the customer, I mean, who is the customer? For the organization, there are two major customers, in an, um, external and internal customers. The external customers are the ones who pay us, the ones who expect to get value for money, those who expect an answer when they call, 
I'm just moving my screen across. And those you expect to get what, what has been committed in some kind of communication to them in terms of what the organization claims to be offering, they're expecting to get that in return and more. Internal customer, everyone in the organization, persons utilizing internal processes, procedures, and systems to provide good and goods and services, and all whom are other companies' external customers. And I guess if we're doing it very well, um, and there are goods and services we could offer to our internal customers, they would also be external customers of ours. So I guess if we're the airlines, or our internal customers could also be external customers if they use us on a regular basis. And I guess that is a big testimonial for any organization for their internal customers to be internal and external customers. The question is always asked of us, who comes first? Who is more important? The customers, external or internal? I think this is really a chicken and egg situation. I'm not quite sure because um, without external customers, there is no internal customers and vice versa. So both are equally important if we were to look at it on an important scale and should be treated with the same level of importance within the context of the business. If your business exists to create and keep customers, then it follows that your employees' experience should be designed to help them serve these customers. Some employees are in direct contact with customers while others indirectly impact customers through their actions. But in all cases, employees ultimately influence whether your organization delivers the customer experience that distinguishes you from all other competitors. So on a scale, I guess I'm, pl I'm placing them both on the same level. While I'm on Sansa, I'm seeing, I, I assume you're admitting who you need to admit. I'm seeing it, requesting it of me as well. This is probably what it looks like. Let me go back up. This is a discussion I think happens in every organization where one person speaks to the other and says, you know, apparently this customer centric culture idea is catching on, you know, like a catch on phrase how do we do it? Then the employee sometimes answers relatively smartly and to some extent very truthfully, you can't start by being nicer to, you can start by being nicer to your employees. You can't really expect your employees to treat customers any different than you treat them. And I guess most, most of us will say, oh, okay, is that what it's really about? There is some truth to that. I mean, we, our, our employees need to be treated in a certain manner so they themselves can carry that message to the customer. It's just that we need to decide what that treatment is all about. Is it that we're going to be having parties on, 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 on the employee's behalf? Is it that we have to have a Christmas party or we have to have bonuses? What is the treatment that they're actually speaking about? Because as far as we are concerned in the organization, employees should be treated and should have similar experiences to the customer to pass or pass it on to the customer. But simply put, as Peter Drucker stated in 1954, which is a long time ago, the purpose of business is to create and keep a customer. Customer experience is a sum of what happens as the customers interact with your company and how they feel through that entire interaction. So this is not really new, is it? Because he spoke to it in 1954. A customer is a customer. A customer has always had the same expectations. I think it's not that they haven't had the expectation in the past, but with the amount of competitors in, 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 in the environment right now, then the, the customer's expectation is even more than it used to be before. But then if organizations, if companies are not customer-centered, what could it be? Because an organization has been designed, well, from, a, from an entrepreneurial business owner, we probably say to be profitable by serving customers or by producing goods and services for customers. So if it's not customer-centered business, what else could it actually be? Well, the questions I'm asked, what are we talking about when you refer to a customer-centered business? 
if business is not customer centered, then what is it? How does a customer centered business differ from a non customer centered business? Let me see if I can answer those questions so that we can all be on the same page. But before I even go on any further, I mean, I think Jamaicans, um, we're all into sports. Um, certainly, athletics is one of the sports that I think we're all into. I think majority of athletes that have represented us on the on the worldwide track, they could possibly be seen as inside out, meaning they are doing the best they can, and as a result, people will come to watch. The one athlete I would probably say is not like that would probably be both because he has an outside in approach other than just than running he has always catered to his customers who have traveled internationally to see him he acknowledges them at the beginning of course he acknowledges our god which is important to all of us and he acknowledges them at the end and sometimes he puts on a performance so basically what we're talking about we're talking about so i would say Bolt is probably a customer centered athlete so when we talk about we talk about when we talk about customer centered business, it really is a business that has an outside in approach to business rather than an inside out. They make decisions based on the customer's need and include him as a part of the decision making. This involves customer interaction when it comes to communication. So the entire communication protocol for decision making takes into consideration the customer when certain decisions are going to be made. These type of organization design systems and processes and procedures with the aim of ensuring customer satisfaction. And for those of us who are in marketing and customer experience, with an aim of delighting the customer going beyond their expectations. An outside in approach at every point that external customer interacts with the business, they have a great customer experience. It's strange how sometimes um, persons in organizations think that customers interact with the, with the business only at customer service or by the salesperson, but their interaction is so much more because they have to interact with the, with the, with the accounts, pay, accounts receivable. And that experience while they're interacting with the accounts receivable is just as important as any other experience. So for outside in approach, every touch point is important to the customer. And this are in, in, in essence allows for continued business from existing customers and new business from potential customers as the experience is actually shared. Leads to good customer experience, which in turn leads to business growth and revenue. So that's what an outside in approach looks like. And that is basically what we're referring to when we talk about a customer center business. What if you're not a customer centered business? What does that look like? But I, 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 should, I, should, I should point out this picture before I go into a non uh, customer centered business. I'm sure if you look at this picture, sometimes I'm not even sure who is actually doing the customer service and who is actually the customer. But ultimately, when customers are satisfied, one expects it to look something like this. I'm going to assume that that is some kind of airline or something to do with probably air, renting a car or something. She has a key in her left hand, so it could possibly be that. If a business is not customer centered, then what is it? It's an organization which has an inside out approach. One that approaches the market claiming and believing that they know best, convinced that their own capabilities will eventually lead to success. One that feels that as long as we produce the best goods and services from their, pers from their perspective, then customers will choose them first. I think this was a belief from some years back because a lot of times it is not even the one who produces the best goods. It is the one who gets it there on time, 
so that it needs, needs a need on time. And, and in many cases, we'll get the market over the person who has perfect codes. So if you're not a customer-centered organization, then one will refer to you as an inside-out approach, one that is using what your company thinks to decide on system processes and procedures. And even as far as to make decisions as to how we act, they actually, you actually employ. So at this juncture, before I even go further, those of us who are in the, in the presentation today, should we say, am I a customer-centered organization or, or am I not? And then, I mean, from that perspective, we can actually move forward. And I guess I can get that response as you move even further into the presentation. When one decides to build a customer-centered organization, now that we're grounded, now that we know exactly what this customer-centered organization is, and we have decided, if that is what you have decided, you can, have, you can give me a little bit of feedback on that, that this is the way we should actually go. How do we actually build a customer-centered organization? I think while researching, I found so much information on this what it's supposed to look like, what is, it gives clear definitions. But one of the things it really never tells you is how do you get it? When building a new way of being, because if you're gonna change your organization, which is not currently a customer-centered organization, you're going to be building, changing, trying to become a new way of being trying to change your organization to become a new way of being is pretty similar to trying to change yourself to become a new way of being. Not an easy task. It's one of those things that I don't think you can eat all at once. One would say you can't eat an entire elephant, take it a piece at a time. So when building a new way of being in an organization or in your personal life, there are probably four major areas to be established. The first one, what is this overall goal and specific objectives that you are trying to achieve by making this change, which all organizations need to understand and document. And we want overall goal, but we want to also know what are the specific objectives you are trying to achieve. Because when we get there, we need to know that we have gotten there and objectives are the ones that are actually measurable. So there are subsets of goals. A goal is general and the objectives are specific to allow you to achieve this goal. Then one has to have a kind of a guiding principle. And I think when we look up on the internet, what we actually are getting is guiding principles. Principles of what should, en should be entailed in this customer-centered business. And third, I would think that, and I mean, given the fact I'm a project manager and I expect things to change, that we want an approach, planning to achieve specific objective and the overall, on the overall goals. So you want to be very specific in approaching and planning and so that you are aware of when you get to objectives. But not only that, you want a roadmap to follow to meet the overall goal. And the fourth of it is actual execution of a plan. So from, from my perspective, I would say we are going to go through four things. We want to understand first and foremost, what is this customer-centered area, which we just discussed. Define it. Try to, try to apply it to who we are, try to make some decisions as to whether or not we are customer-centered. Then we're going to get some overall goals and specific objectives around it. A guiding principle, which I think if we don't have guiding principles, I can, I'm going to speak to a few here, which I got from the internet and from other books, but there are several books on that. Um, and an approach and planning to achieve specific objectives, and overall goals, and then the execution plan. So first of all, what is this overall goals and specific objectives as it relates to us and our organizations becoming customer-centered? I'm just gonna use some examples so that I can have you key into your organization and what possible objectives or overall goals you could be trying to meet by actually becoming a customer-centered organization. And some of those for me, when I look at the overall goal, I probably say to build an organization that is externally focused by making profit through continued increased sales to satisfied customers. Now, that it to me is general until you say it. Profit of X million short billion dollars. That is very specific. So from 
the perspective of an objective, one wants first the general, which is the goal, and then the specific, which is exactly what I'm trying to get to, so that when we think we have gotten there, we have something to measure it against. So the first thing is making profit, which I think all of us are in business for, to continue to increase sales to satisfy customers with a specific objective of making X million stroke billion of dollars within a specific period of time. The next one is creating organizational structures designed to meet customer needs. One will also understand that sometimes when we have organizational diagrams and structures, we, we often find that there are silos and one department doesn't speak to the other department or there's competition between one department and the other. And ultimately the customer is the one who feels it. So one would say we want to create organizational structures designed to meet customer needs, allowing for communication, cross communication and, uh, across departments to ultimately meet the customer's need. There should, I mean, the customer really shouldn't come in. I mean, I don't know how many of us have actually gone into certain kinds of organization. For me, sometimes I don't want to say a little bit of red tape. I don't want to name the type of organization. And then you say to them, I'm here to collect such and such a document to which I applied for over three weeks ago. And the person says to you, well, you know, Miss Smith, well, I did my best, you know, because I sent off the document. But it's such a, such a department we are waiting for, and they have not yet completed. But you're supposed to have a two-week turnaround time, but I don't know, what else can I say, other than I'm waiting for such a, such a department. The customer doesn't want to hear that. The customer wants the document that you have promised a two-week turnaround time in. So the next one, the next objective could clearly be creating organizational structures designed to meet customer needs. And one could say for all departments, which would be 100% of the organizational structure at the end of this process should be designed to meet the customer's requirements. A third example of objectives and, and overall goals could be employing and training team members to respond and exceed customer expectation. And then I added that at least 80% of the staff should have been carefully selected and trained at the end of this change process to meet customer expectations, regardless of what department they are in. Now, when you have objectives that are as specific as this, this is what we will be working towards. This is what we're going to be planning for. And this is what we're going to be measuring ourselves against. So we're going to have um, employees that are trained and are ready for, to meet customer expectations. Our departmental structures will be ready and structured in a way to which this can be met. And of course, during the next six months, we need to make a profit of X million dollars or billions, whichever one you are referring to. I actually prefer the billions and I would probably change, put a, a, a US, X, US dollar X beside that. But um, let me continue to work towards that and the rest of us can too. But I do understand that with a customer-centered organization, which exceeds the, 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 the customer requirement, that the meeting of a, a profit or exceeding the planned profit is extremely possible. So now that we have the overall goals and objectives, I mean, I, I actually, I wanted to touch that because in the absence of that, there is nothing to, to plan for, there is nothing to execute, and there's nothing for us to decide whether or not we are successful. So that's the first thing we want to understand is this is what we want to get done. The second aspect of it is, 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 is having a guiding principle, which I think when you are on the internet, and I mean, I've taken on a few of them myself, you know, we want to operationalize customer empathy. That's a, that's a, a guide to me, even though they say, it's a step-by-step, step, or this is the way you build customer-centered organization. To me, it to me comes more across like an, a, a principle. 
Um, and this is a principle to which while we are planning and executing, we want to make sure that our organization has empathy, customer empathy. We want to make sure that we hire, employ for customer orientation. It's a guiding principle, but one would have to define what is this customer orientation? What do we look for in our uh, in new employees and existing employees to decide whether they are oriented? So these are for me, coming from the internet, very, very good guiding principles. Facilitate direct interaction with customers. Make sure there are, there, there are channels and communication systems to facilitate us speaking to the customer, but for the, for, to get feedback from the customer to us, not only to the, 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 the department who is interacting with the customer, but to the entire organization. Link employee culture to customer outcome, outcome. making sure our culture is customer oriented. Tie compensation to the customer. Tie all of our payments, all of our bonuses, all of our incentives, all those should be tied to meeting the customer's expectation. Some of us might tie to that as well as making our profitability, as well as making, keeping our expense within the, within the budget. So there are several places, but certainly could tie the compensation to customer satisfaction to ensure that the organization is customer centered. And I mean, oh, that's, is that me? Yes. Some other things that you might find on the internet um, are choose the right communication tools. And to me, this is also a guiding principle because the whole communication protocol I, I, I get across the organization becomes so important at this point. One has to make sure that there is seamless communication from back office to front office and from front office back to, to back office while ens to ensure that we meet the customer's requirements. So it's going to tell you things like establish an own ownership of all communication across teams. I think that is more referring to things like, let's make sure there are cross there's cross communication between departments. Let's break down the silos, create consistency across all, all touch points. No matter where in the, where in the organization the customer um, interfaces, he or she should have a consistent response that makes him or her feel as if they are they, they are worth it, worth it to the customer and, and they have come across come out being satisfied. Gather and implement customer feedback. These are all these are all um, guiding principles that we would want to use while we are planning. Um, build a larger ecosystem to meet customer preferences, meaning we want to be able to capture the information on their preferences and make sure we are aware of what they need. Exceed the customer's expectation at every interaction. Well, you know, deciding whether or not we have met or exceeded expectation is a very specific area one needs to be able to understand and measure and gather information from, from the customer to tell us whether or not we have made it. Empower your business users, which I think is major. I mean, in the hierarchical organizational designs that we currently have, you find that the average person in, a, in an organization does not really have the power to make decisions around how they service the customer. And this is actually saying, please empower them so that they can make quick decisions with a quick, a, a proper background and exceed the customer's expectation. So I think there's quite a bit on the internet. This came directly from there, so this is not directly from me, came from, directly from the internet. <clears throat> but this is all around guiding principles that we should possibly use as we move forward in creating a customer-centered centered business. Why I think it's key is the guiding principles are great. I actually like them. They allow us to plan to ensure that what we deliver meets the quality that is required. But what I really think we are lacking in the organization is the discipline. Having had the veranda chat, having listened to all of that everybody has to say, how do I make the next step within my organization to achieve these overall objectives and goals? That's a key area. 
we don't want to be going into meetings saying, you know what the problem is, guys? We're not customer centered. And I mean, we just talk about it. I mean, the next thing we could possibly do, I mean, in my time, I haven't listened to the radio in a long time. It's called, it's called Agri or Run It Twits and say, you know what I think? Jamaica is not customer centered. And we just talk, 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 talk. What we need to do is to systematically have an approach and deliberately plan to meet the organization customer centered. And I want to spend a little time there so I can, I can point out to the persons who are here an approach to which you could possibly take. So an approach to planning to achieve specific objectives and overall planning. Step one in planning. If you are in a small organization with two persons, you can possibly open and close it and re-employ re people and employ the right people and then go back onto the market. But if you're an ongoing concern, perhaps you can't do that overnight. What one would suggest is that you do an analysis of the company and the, con and the culture to understand if inside, out or outside, in approach defines the company or just parts of the company. You don't want to start spending money to fix something that you don't need to fix. So you want to spend some time understanding your company, where it stands as a whole company, is it every single department that's contributing? So let us say we decide that this company is not a customer-centered company. It has a total, total inside out approach. Is it 100% of the company that is that way? Is there some parts of the company that is centered but is over, overruled by the majority who are not centered? So that analysis is very important. I mean, we need to sit down and really look to get a feel as to where we are to decide where we need to get. Once you understand where you are, you know, then the next step is to prepare that roadmap plan. How are we going to do it? We can handle everything at one time. How are we going to make a decision as to which areas should we actually tackle first and when we see the result there, we can go into another area. Or do we need to tackle two or three areas at the same time so that we can have the impact we want to have on our customers and move this organization closer to being customer centered. So that is step, step, step two, we're preparing a roadmap. Once we've prepared the roadmap, then there's step three, let us execute. And step four, you know what? I'll discuss the start over when I get to it. Remember organizations are ongoing concerns. So within this section, now that we're going to decide where we're going to do some kind of analysis. I mean, a lot of us specialize in this area with data, we gather data, we try to understand how different areas react, et cetera, et cetera. And I just created a simple analytical tool where I'm looking at the areas in the organization, the accountability for in the areas where, where there are critical success factors, external customer, yes or no, internal customer, yes or no, a kind of description of what the area does. And then I'm going to say, as it relates to the external customer, how does this area impact? Is it, does it have a high impact, a medium impact, a low impact? And based on responses coming in, are my customers satisfied? And then I could possibly look at our comments. Certainly, this is not a, I have not populated this fully, but at the end of it, I could possibly say the, per, the areas with the highest impact and has the least customer satisfaction, whether it's internal or external, perhaps those are the areas I should tackle first. And then we could add further columns for further analysis so that you are in a better position to systematically choose the areas to which you work on. I mean, this is even more important for us as SMEs. Those, we really don't have that kind of resources at our disposal. For us to just say that we're going to go into our overall program to totally revamp what we are doing and then come out as a fully customer-centered organization overnight takes resources. It takes resources, it takes money, and we are not necessarily in a position to do that. But certainly if we do the proper analysis, then we are in a position to target the areas with the first and foremost significant impact on the customer and then to gradually move to the other areas within a period of time after to ensure that the organization is fully is a fully customer centered organization so this is an example of what type of anal analysis that you should do and i would recommend that spend the time spend the time to find out where you really are along this path 
you might say, you know, I mean, as an entrepreneur myself, I know that sometimes it's overwhelming and we just say, you know what, we're just totally not doing it right. Um, that's usually an emotional response coming from those of us who are spending the money. Uh, but when you really do the analysis is when you can pick up, it's not necessarily so. And it allows us to tackle the areas that are of most importance. Once you understand those areas and you can select them and make a plan to change them, then, then you are in a position to plan. I mean, I'm a project manager, as Sansia had said, I can't help myself. So I think you should prepare the roadmap. I mean, I selected also the, the analysis a while ago, the customer service area. Review an area designed to meet customers and I would go through all the things that I would need to do, engage customers in what they want, to get a feedback, design areas based on feedback, train staff, possibly roll, I roll out a new customer service area, again, engage the customers, meet customers' needs. If answer is yes, move to the next area. If answer is no, then I'm going to have to revisit it. If answer is yes, then one could say we have a fully formed new customer service area. That is meeting the organizational cost um, thing. And very specific dates. Uh, what I have left off of this diagram is an allocation of who has accountability for what. And that is very important in the plan. Who has accountability for reviewing and designing the meet the customers? And what are they supposed to produce to make us see what that design looks like and how we sign off on it to make sure that's what we're going to be using. So I would say prepare a roadmap, do the plan. But you have something to follow. I know there's so many things about that. I, I, I guess somebody is going to help me with that. To not to plan, to plan, to not plan is to plan to fail. Um, we've been speaking about it for years and it would never happen if we never actually sit down and prepare the, the roadmap. The fourth section is execution of the plan. Assign the team members, hold them accountable. Don't just establish the project and then leave it alone and not follow up to make sure that at the end of it, we really have a fantastic customer service area. Have regular meetings to ensure that the members are executing as per plan. I have the plan to the left, I have a plan on this side. We want to talk about when it's actually, when it's actually completed, when we're putting in who is assigned to it, when we're sharing that with the persons who have assigned it and follow up on it guide team members as required. When there are certain questions coming up, go back to your guiding principles. Use your guiding principles to make decisions or, or to answer the questions that you might have about what the next step should be. Or if there's a problem, how do we solve it? Let's use our guiding principle and then we solve it from there. And, 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 and guys, deliver us plan. That is how you're going to make your organization this customer-centered organization. Remember, you know, from the very top of this presentation, we'll talk about what is the general, what is the objectives and, and goals. If that is clearly documented, when we come to a stage of execution, we know what it's going to look like, and therefore we're in a position to say whether or not it has met it. That's step three, when execute the plan, assign the team members, have regular meetings, ensure team members are executing, guide team members as required, deliver as per plan. Can a plan change? Yes, it can change. A plan changing does not necessarily change what we are delivering. If something changes in the environment, I mean, something just changed drastically for us, we are actually in COVID, then the plan can change because something has changed in the environment, you might have to execute differently. I am sure in a couple of months by, I could have stood in front of you in the office and had this presentation, but we are still presenting. The plan hasn't changed, the plan has changed in terms of how I present, but it doesn't, hasn't necessarily changed in terms of presentation. So when something comes up in the environment, comes up in the organization, as long as we understand it, we are in a position to make changes to the way we do things, not necessarily to the outcome that we are expecting to get. So that is step three, plan and execute, something change, and what you want to do is go back and replan. Four, gather customer feedback again. You are continuing to do the analysis where, where issues customer dissatisfaction can come from and fix them to meet the customer need. You need to remember that this customer, this customer centered approach, I, it doesn't really feel like a destination. It feels like an ongoing thing. 
So therefore, when we have done it and seen improvement, our competitors have also done it and seen improvement and some, sometimes even more than us, so we have to keep going. It's going to always be, we have executed, let's gather back customer feedback, do the analysis again, and let's continue along that path. Some other approaches I think that I think is necessary that we should bring up as well in planning and execution um, of creating a customer centered business. And one of the approaches I think is, which I think is so applicable today. I mean, I'm not going to be teaching you about agile, but the agile approach is an approach that for me as a young professional in IT during those days, when the agile, when agile was introduced is one that gave us quick results it's really a planning approach with agility which allows us to see the results much quicker so i think an agile approach can be used if you really are in a situation where certain things need to change literally overnight because even though you might not become 100% customer centered, and I don't know if you'd ever get to the 100%, but let's, let's get there as close as possible. There are a few things to which you can actually put in place through Agile. The Agile approach really allows you to, on a regular basis, have stand-up meetings with cross-functional teams, say, here, and respond to customer feedback. So you could use Zoom like we're using now, you could use conference calls, people don't really need to get it from their desk or from their home. And one person could state exactly how a customer responded to anything he or she has provided to the customer. Because it's a cross-functional team, immediately the team is in a position to decide what is their contribution to that result. And for those who need time to think, the necessary questions can be asked so that we can get from the individual team members in the various department areas what do they think is their contribution and once we understand the contribution as a team we can decide what is to be changed so if we have customer feedback we get that into the meeting which is a stand-up meeting guys when we say it's a stand-up i'm actually sitting down but i mean a stand-up meeting stand-up meetings mean it is maximum at all if that much one is half an hour to 45 minutes. That's with their chain. And then in that meeting, we can say, based on this dissatisfaction of our customer, if we change this in accounting today and we change that, that this part in purchasing, as well as we change this in sales, etc., then we would have covered this, this dissatisfaction. And the team in consensus makes a decision to make the change overnight. Making plans to change what we can change today. And for what we cannot change today, making plans for changing that which takes time to change with constant follow-up and accountability for this change. That stand-up meeting allows you. This should be recorded. This is not a meeting that just happens and is not orderly, not recorded. It takes a lot of discipline. It takes us recording and it takes us following up consistently to make sure that changes are made and that our customers come away ultimately satisfied. Fully incorporating customer feedback into our processes, allowing for processes and, and procedures changes were necessary to ensure, ensure great customer experience. Now, last but not least in this area of approaches is full utilization of technology to facilitate rapid responses from and to the customer. I mean, today we are on Zoom, I mean, we have so many other areas to which we could have a response from the customer. There, there's a feedback, there's a one-off question that we can ask them. There's a question we can ask them if we're delivering food. Can you just tick this box if you're satisfied? I mean, don't overwhelm them, but do whatever, use the technology. I mean, I think like even like in restaurants and they have all of these iPads and you can actually just answer a question, tick, tick after you make the, the menu choice and you can answer about the person who served you utilize the technology so that you can facilitate a rapid response from and to the customer and ease of communication among team members and departments serving internally and ultimately the external customer so i think those are three things we could actually use 
utilization of agile approach, fully incorporating customer feedback, and full utilization of the technology to get the customer feedback. I don't have, I sense I have no idea of where we are on, in terms of time, but certainly I'm at the point now where I really have to have a discussion about. You're at a, you're at a good point. If you have more information, you can share. All right, we have, well, I, I'm, I'm almost at the end. So, all right, uh, no problem. Yeah. So, having looked at all of that, guys, in terms of, well, we know what this customer centered era is, era is. What is it for it to be a customer centered business? It's very strange to or sometimes our employees expect so much when they are customers, but when they are our employees, they are not giving it to our customers. That question I often ask about persons who report to me. Is that what you'd want from a business? Is that what you would want a business to do for you? Tell me where do you back? What if such, such, such a thing happen? What would you expect them to do? When you get to the doctor's office, what would you expect them to do? And the expectation is nowhere aligned to how we are, we are responding to our customer. I'm sure I'm not the only one facing that because all of us are someone else's customer. But with all that discussion about what it is that we, what is this customer centered? Um, what are the, 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 the principles behind it and the underlying guidelines? How do we approach it? How do we plan for it? I think it's a little bit like real estate I mean, years ago, I remember asking my boss, what it is, how do I go about buying real estate? And he said to me, Janet, there are three important factors that you should bear in mind. And I was all excited about what are these three factors? Because of course, I was young and I was about to look at the possibility of buying real estate. And he turned to me and he says, location, location, and location. And I stopped for a while. Well, having gone through many years is realizing that that's what it is. Location, location, and location. When you're buying somewhere, make sure it's in the right location because after a while, location is going to sell it or location is going to give it its value. For us in this customer satisfaction, customer-centered organization, there is really not a lot to it, you know. Achieving customer satisfaction, excellent customer service. So us, this is a daily process. And I mean, I love Agile because daily we're going to improve our processes. Daily we're going to react based on what we heard yesterday. We're going to make ourselves better today. And they are achieved through the major tools of open communication with customers. Open communication with customers. Open communication with customers. So there are the three most important things. Communication, communication, and communication. That's it for me. Thanks, guys. Question and answer. Thank you for listening. Fancy, you there? Yes, I was just struggling to find my mic for a minute, but thank you very much. I mean, what a great note to end on. Communication, communication, communication. And, um, I just want to go back over a few of the things that you said, you know, because you, you really had some really good information in there. And I wanted to find out from our participants, have you identified if your organization has an inside out approach or an outside in approach to your customers? Because remember that in any case, both your internal and your external customers are important. And so how have you been able to deal with the customers? As Janet said, the way that the employees treat the customers, is that something that you would want for yourself? How, how do you guide your team members? And very important, she said something, and it is the only thing that I remember um, from the presentation it will be deliver as you plan whatever you plan to deliver make sure that's what you deliver are there any questions from anybody remember this is the point at which we take questions you can either type it into the chat or raise your hand 
I have one question that I see in the chat here, Janet, and it's from Jordan Ferguson. It says, as it pertains to the suggestion of having regular meetings to ensure that team members are executed, how do you prevent against team members feeling micromanaged? Well, um, the concept of micromanage is a concept that I, I, I won't say I'm very comfortable or uncomfortable with. Micromanage is implying that I cannot get a job done unless you follow upon me. Right. Um, if that is what is implying, then I don't think you cannot get a job done unless you follow upon me. I think you cannot get a, you are not going to get a job done unless you're followed upon. Um, I, I think it's a lot to do with your management style, a lot to do with how you ask the questions. One wants to come across as I am, I am here to assist you to get to the end result. My only reason for following up is if you have a problem, let me help you to solve it so that you can get to the end result. Well, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, man, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, we're not following up for any other reason. Um, they're, they're, I, I, don't, I, I would say I would not have employed somebody or given them an, a, a job to do if I didn't think they could do it. But oh, given, yeah. The fact, yeah, given the fact that resources that are available to them are not necessarily equal to the resources that are available to me, and therefore they can book up on a problem to which they cannot solve within the resources that they have use me so that I can actually provide the resources to solve the problem. So I think that's really how it should come across. The language should be carefully thought about. No one wants to be micromanaged because it comes across negatively, but certainly in the way we manage our team and how we communicate, we are actually only following up to give you the assistance that you need at any point in time. I think it probably comes down to personality though, because there are managers who micromanage. I mean, there will be persons who are, or other employers who will give, a, give, a, give an employee a job to do. They know that the employee is capable, but they, it's like they're unwilling to let go of the situation and allow the employee to, to, to handle it. And I understand from the perspective of you having resources that the employee may not necessarily have. Because I do it sometimes with my, with our CEO at, at JBDC. Sometimes there are things that I need to do that my limited connections cannot do it. So I'll go and say, Ms. V, make a call for me now so that this can be done efficiently. So maybe probably the best thing to do is to wait for the employee to ask for help in the situation. I mean... Of course, you have to take into consideration your business <laughs> operations. But, you know, if you don't want to come across as micromanaging, <laughs> I don't know how you feel about that, how you feel about a recommendation like that, waiting for the employee to come and say, Miss Smythe, I'm having a problem. How, how you feel about that? I, I would have to, I, I would have to probably say to you, I would never wait for the employee, employee to come to me. Okay. Here's the difference. For me, there's a difference between micromanage and following up. Micromanagement is one where the manager is telling you how to get your job done. So when you are following up, the person is reporting to you as to where they are and the challenges that they are having. When a, a, ma a manager micromanages you, what they are doing is saying, what are you doing now? Let me tell you how to get it done. You shouldn't do it that way, you know. I think you should do it this way. That's a totally different thing from follow-up. Follow-up is, can you tell me where you are, Sansil? Any challenges, any problems, etc. Do you think you'll still be on time for the, for the, for the um, that read date and time? Is there any help that I can actually give you? Have you faced any problems? But that's not micromanaging. Micromanaging is when you are telling me that, you know what, tell me what you're doing, Sansil. How are you doing it? Yes. But you know something, if you never put this one in this column and put it into the next column, it would have added correctly. But to be honest, it don't really matter which column it is as long as you put the right formula, it's okay. Right. So therefore, I would, I would not mix the two. Follow-up and, and micromanagement is two different things. Follow-up is to ascertain. Right, 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 right. And there's a huge difference between the two. The two of them. Very, there, is a, there is a big difference. And managers must delegate, but they cannot abdicate. 
right, the fact right. That you delegated does not remove you from the accountability of getting it done. Right. And in that, you have employed very, very good people to do it. You need to follow up to make sure that they have what is required to complete the job. And follow up is very important. It's a very important step in the delivery process. In the customer delivery process, very, very important. The customer gives us a, a, a complaint. One should be getting back to the customer with a resolution. Exactly. All right. I'm going to allow Jordan to ask his question because I, I don't know if it's a, it's a follow-up to the question that was placed in the, in the chat. So go ahead, Jordan. All right. So great morning. Thank you for allowing me to speak, Sansia. Um, great morning, Janet. Thank you for that um, presentation. Um, so I love the distinction that you just made a while ago as it pertains to the difference between micromanagement and follow-ups. Um, so I guess based on the wording that you use, um, when you said regular meetings, I mean, in, in just my understanding, a follow-up is touch and go. So you don't, my understanding is you don't need a meeting for that. So why would you have a regular meeting if you're just following up? One of the things about it is that when you, you can follow up in several ways, but one of the reasons for su suggesting meetings is because then everybody that impacts that result is in that meeting at that point in time. It is then we get an idea as to what is impacting the overall result from everybody's perspective. When you listen to an individual, you might not understand it is impacting somebody else. As the manager, you, there's no manager that knows it all. It is persons who are experiencing it that knows it. And it, it is only at that point that we really know that if something is happening on Janet's desk, it is likely to impact Sansia's desk. Right. So that's why we, we suggest meetings. But meetings must be well-organized and timely. Efficient. And efficient and timely. Yes. We, touch, we, we refer to it as a touch-based meeting, half an hour. If it goes to 45 minutes, then it has to be stopped. It needs to have an objective, just like how I said that the overall exercise needs gen a gen um, to have an objective. The meeting must have an objective, and the objective must be met, and we need to come out of the meeting. Exactly. All right. Um, going to some other comments. Judith Gale says, thank you for the timely information. Andre. Andre Samuels has a question. When customers are abusive, Janet, what is the best way to handle the situation? Well, you know, um, I don't, a customer is a person. Um, and in any situation where people are abusive, the, the response should never be to go up against the customer. One should move into silence to listen. If it's physical, etc., then of course the organization will need to do what is required to gently remove the customer. But if a customer gets very quarrelsome and cussing you off and mm. that kind of thing, is to go into silence. And I think that, and you know, a lot of persons event. I think you need to remind, remember that a customer is a person, right. and people do this. When they are under stress from home, if they have had a relative that passed, if they have somebody in the hospital, if they are their spouse had a big argument this morning, they will vent. And you just have to say one thing and they're off. What you need to say is one less. Just listen. All right, let me ask you this. How do you feel about an organization that separates from a customer? Have you ever, ever heard of a situation like that where an organization had to, I'm sorry about that. Yes. Where an organization had to separate from a customer because of an abusive relationship, particularly with one of your, maybe one of your staff members or with you as the business owner. Have you ever heard of a situation like that? Yes, yes, yes I have. I mean, I have experienced it myself as well. And I have made a time decision to, to be separated from the customer. Um, to me, that timely decision is very necessary because what you find is that if you allow it to go on to the other side of the situation, it's not, there's no likely recovery. So right. sometimes a timely separation is required. 
I mean, years ago, we used to do a training session about um, relationship and relationship management and the stages of a relationship. And there is a stage to which exit is, 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 the, best, is the best thing to do. Right, okay. I mean, and sometimes when you exit timely, you'd be surprised that person might recommend somebody else to you. Because yes. when you're exiting, you're going to exit and you're going to probably suggest another company who could assist them. Not, we're not exiting with malice, you know, this one is not working out. It doesn't right. necessarily mean, mean that the person's needs cannot be met. Perhaps another company, you could make a suggestion and exit with grace. Right. You don't allow it to go over to the side where the grace, the grace is eliminated. All right, comment from Amory Wilson. Thanks, Janet, great presentation. Lots to take away and implement to improve my own approach. Um, uh, I, would, I know that Judith had said she asked, had a question, but I don't see it. Question from, hmm, no, it's not a question. It's a comment from Paul Asserties. What Janet is speaking to is follow up. Same thing you were saying. Big difference to micromanaging. As a cafe owner, my staff loves to have meetings on a regular basis to give feedback. And if they're tasked with something, they want guidance along the way. Um, yeah. All right, so there is another question. Can you provide a little clarity to the outside in philosophy, Janet? It's, like it's, it's literally taking a, it's, it's like, no, I don't know to use simple language and saying, it, take, taking the temperature at all time of what is happening outside. So it's like your physical body, you know, the temperature of your body, but you're, you're constantly checking the environment around you to see what the temperature is, is like outside. And before your body reacts to the temperature by going into freezing, you're checking the temperature outside so you know you need to get your jacket. That's an outside in approach. Right. Um, that, that would simplify it. So, you know, like, for example, when you're in the U.S. or any one of those countries that are cold, you know, you don't walk outside because you're feeling nice and warm when you wake up. You go to and listen to the TV, and if it says the temperature is going to be X today, then you get your jacket and whatever, and you prepare yourself and go and do it. Similarly, you don't want to just do things because this is the way the organization always did it. What you want to do is to listen to what is happening on the outside and change the organization on the inside to meet the customer's requirements. Okay. All right, let me check if there are any other comments. Um, where am I? All right, no, there are no more comments and I don't see any hands. So on that note, Janet, I wanna thank you so much for joining us this morning for our JBDC virtual biz zone. As I indicated, we've been talking about a lot of things over the past two and a half, going almost three months now. And we've been sharing a lot with our client group and we trust that it's been useful information that have helped you all to move your business a little bit further. We don't want anybody to panic because we know COVID is a real thing. We don't know how long it's going to be with us. And so we have to learn to cope. We have to learn to live with it. And so this is JBDC's contribution to the MSME sector in helping our client group to cope as best as possible. So thank you so much, Janet, for taking time out of your schedule to be with us this morning. The information that you shared was very useful, very practical, and I hope that our group um, got some got something out of it. So yeah. as a reminder, everyone, um, if you know someone that missed the session, remember it will be available on our JBDC YouTube page, JBDC Jamaica. All you have to do is subscribe so that you'll get the notification when the videos are posted. If you missed any of the presentations, the previous presentation, either from the JBDC Biz Zone, JBDC in Concert, or our entrepreneur's journey, please feel free to go to our JBDC to make a page and you can get all the videos there. Of course, we are very active on social media. So follow us on Facebook and on Instagram and you can get our daily updates. Thank you again, everybody, and have a fantastic day. Okay. Same to you, Sansil. Thank you.